we were vibrant, we were alive, we care in some sense more about that time than we care about our own time because we were alive in a different way. What music came out in 1971? Um, I got it in a birthday card from my friend Dave. Um, uh, uh, my Love is Alive by the Gary Parsons Project. I don't know. Tell me, my friend. Joni Mitchell's Blue came Ooh, out in blue. 1971. Rolling Stone's Sticky Fingers. Mm. A uh, little thing called Led Zeppelin IV, mm. right? So think about it. Hey, hey, mama, say the way you move. Gonna make you sweat. Gonna make you good. Get the guitar. Come on. You got to play me a happy no, birthday. Brush. Drums on that one. Bonham's drums are completely, I don't know what time he's in, but it's, it's crazy tight. We didn't know about Stairway to Heaven until 1971. That's right. Okay. And, you know, mm -hmm. Bowie was thinking about changes. We care about so much that was happening around that time. Hmm. We were vibrant. We were alive. We care in some sense more about that time than we care about our own time because we were alive in a different way. And, you know, it's very hard to imagine um, how different things were. That was the year that a uh, physicist... Um, organized a break in to the oh, FBI wow. offices in media, Pennsylvania, and told us effectively to look up the word COINTELPRO, revealing an entire dirty tricks campaign of our intelligence community against American citizens. Mm -hmm. um, physicists from Haverford. We were totally alive in a way that we are not totally alive now. The possibilities uh, of what could be, I don't think, um, you know, we'd just been to the moon. We didn't know what we would do next. I think that when we actually have the ability to explore the galaxies and to understand our context, there will be a shift in human understanding of ourselves. And I do think that when we actually have discussions with something that was not built around these parts, um, it will be humbling. I, I, I have viewed us as North Sentinel Island. We may very well be under control of something like India. And I worry a lot about North Sentinel Island and whether or not they have a Fermi paradox. Like, hey, where is everybody? Um, nobody's allowed to land on North Sentinel Island without permission of the Indian government, and they don't go there anymore. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is that, um, that's going to happen, it's going to be big, and then we're going to have the weird Captain Cook phenomenon. You have to remember that Captain Cook showed up in Hawaii. They thought he was God. They gave him an unbelievable time with feasts and revelry and pageantry. And then he had such a good time that he came back a short time later and they said, wait, you're here again. And they killed him. Um, right. So to kill God on his second tri uh, trip through because he was taking way too much of the locals good stuff, we can get bored of absolutely anything. Now, what I'm trying to suggest is try to imagine that you're not thinking about going to the Grand Canyon or Cappadocia uh, or, um, you know, seeing Angel Falls on the Tepuis or something like that. But you're actually thinking about billions of different de destinations with a world that is so unimaginably rich that you're just excited that, uh, that it's not the world being your oyster, but um, the universe or, you know, in my hopes, the observerse. That, I think that's where I am. I, I've gotten to the point where I don't want to have earthbound conversations anymore. I'm so completely confused. Why do we, why do we rat hole to use the software term, uh, on the same issues day in and day out, they progress, not at all. And we just learn to distrust each other and hate each other. We're jealous of each other. I, I called this, I've started to call this the, the degraded state where when you respond to a friend with LOL or, you know, right, nah, <laughs> there's like no verbs or anything. We're, we're just sort of grunting at each other over the internet, angry that other people seem to be having a better time than we are. We're not doing the work we need to be doing. More or less, private enterprise is the only thing that's still really working at the moment. And it's not like government is working. It's not like science is, is working the way I want it to. Um, what, what I see over and over again is, is that the, the part of the world that's still working is private enterprise, and we may lose that too.
I, I, Brian, I think that I'm actually wildly more optimistic than you are, and I, I don't mean to be mean on your birthday. Um, but the thing that I find that you do that's most optimistic is that you're willing to risk for changing things. You know, you're willing to talk about Stephen Meyer on a science podcast when I know that some number of your colleagues will just say, oh, wow, good to know. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if anybody says anything like intelligent design, and I know you don't, you're not an anti-scientific person. We've got to save this. And I really think that people like you and me are not doing enough in terms of trying to lead because we don't, even the concept of leadership is somehow tied to Hitler. Anybody who tries to lead, you'll see people say, oh, wow, it's Svengal. He's <laughs> trying to put money in his own pocket. Right. Or, authoritarian. You know, it's, 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 it's ego trip, authoritarian. I, I'm optimistic that we can do something, and I'm pessimistic that we will do something. I think that there's plenty to do. We're nobody. Let me say something else about Silicon Valley. I'm very concerned that my friend Mark Andreessen is quite correct about software eating the world. What I think that Silicon Valley didn't understand is that what we did is we hoovered up a bunch of people who have technical chops. We brought them away from the command line, so they're not actually coding. They call them technologists. They make fabulous amounts of money learning that everything that you build that is of an institutional character can be disintermediated, disintermediated with a program. Mm. That set us up to lock up all of the best minds, <laughs> not all of them, but let me speak hyperbolically, <laughs> many of the best minds with much of the world's wealth, eager to solve problems, afraid to build or invest in anything. Because God forbid, what if somebody took money and, and, and used it to check into the Four Seasons uh, and went to a day spa and, and, uh, and hung out by the pool? You know, oh my God, that would be wasting taxpayer money or, or, or you know, so, somebody's like trying to have a good time. We need, roughly speaking, to make sure that our scientific community has institutions and are insulated. That what is the purpose of billions of dollars, if not FU money. I don't grasp this. Mm. I don't believe in redistribution of wealth. I do believe in a redistribution of FU. The people who need to say FU need the resources and the insulation to say FU. And that's how we learn how to trust. I, I had a tweet the other day about you can either have scientists, you can have scientists you can control and you can have scientists you can trust. And I very carefully said, choose up to one. You can have science, scientists that you neither control or trust. I'm not disputing that. But if you control your scientists, then you fundamentally cannot trust them. That's right. And we need to risk scientists who are capable of saying no because they're insulated. And if you don't insulate scientists from the market, you will not get a functioning... Uh, China's going to figure this out at the same time that we're, we're, we're uh, fetishizing diversity, inclusion, and equity. And they're going to leap ahead of us where they're going to do what the Soviets did. Like the Soviets had sh crazy Sharyashka prisons where you put very smart people in country club prisons and told them to do work. And the, the prisons were re relatively nice. This is where Leon Theremin, for example, developed the ability to use a window pane as a microphone so that they could listen in on the U.S. Embassy by mm -hmm. watching the vibration. You know, those sorts of things. Um, China's going to have to experiment with freedom. And what we're going to do is we're going to experiment with shackling people with loyalty oaths, forcing them to repeat things that make no sense because they want to be seen as good people and they don't want doors slammed in their face if they want grants renewed. And I think it's incredibly imperative that either the government or private wealth or a bank heist or something is used to insulate the scientists who we depend on to know what's going on with this virus, what is going on with the physical prospects for going beyond Einstein. Can you please stop lying to me about string theory and tell me where we actually are? You know, you've seen this on your program. Every time you ask a string theorist, well, you know, what's the most important thing in the world? Geez, we've got the theory of everything. <laughs> it's called string theory. I want this tattooed on, on my forehead and I want it on my headstone. Come on. Well, I, I have a new phrase now, Eric, that, that string theory is perhaps the most 
important theory ever devised for describing string theory. 